<clears throat> so chapter 11 is really all about uh, understanding stockholders' equity a little bit more. Um, it starts off with um, advantages and disadvantages of being a corporation. Uh, it then, so we're going to be looking at, at learning objective one very quickly. We've seen this way back in chapter one, if you can believe it. Um, so it's going to be some of a repeat. Uh, learning objective two, probably the important thing to understand is um, some, uh, you know, we have common stock. We've heard of common stock. Uh, some companies issue something called preferred stock. So you got to understand and identify that. And sometimes companies buy back their own stock, which is what treasury stock is. Okay. Uh, for learning objective three, the only thing we're going to focus on is the cash dividend, because that's the most common um, type of dividend that there is. There are other types of dividends, but cash dividends are very important to sort of understand. And then we're going to do just a little bit of analysis at the end of this as well. So it's sort of topical throughout. And uh, let's get started. So learning objective one, again, uh, talks about um, corporations and characteristics of a corporation. The first thing you need to know is you have to apply to become a corporation in any of the 50 states. You can be, uh, you can apply, you don't have to apply in New York just because you're based in New York. You can apply in any of the 50 states. States are, uh, have jurisdiction over business law uh, with the exception of interstate commerce that goes to the federal government. But uh, so as states um, hold business law under their jurisdiction, they are the ones who set up the criteria of how to become a corporation. It's an application process. Um, most, most of the time you'll need a lawyer to help fill this type of thing out. You have to tell them uh, what's the purpose of the corporation. Corporations are legal entities under the law. So <clears throat> as a legal entity, of course, you can pursue a vast majority of purposes. Uh, for a lot of, uh, for most of us, we're going to be focusing in on, of course, the for-profit motive, which is the reason I'm organizing as a corporation is because I have things to sell for a profit. And that's typically how we look at things. But just know that corporations can also be not-for-profit organizations, which means they're, organi they're organized around a particular mission. <clears throat> that mission could be educational. Most colleges are nonprofit organizations. Could be uh, religious. Um, all of your you know, churches, synagogues, mosques are, are organized as not-for-profit corporations. Um, they could be... Um, social, environmental, mission-based. So whether it's a YMCA um, or, you know, the, the walkway across the Hudson, or these are non-for-profit. The purpose of the corporation is to help promote certain things or protect certain things. Um, and that's their existence. They're not in it for profit. So that's, uh, that's the first type of thing <clears throat> that you're gonna ask, be asked to do. And then uh, once you get approved to become a corporation, all corporations are broken up into shares of ownership. Uh, all corporations start as private corporations. In other words, uh, the ownership, the shares of ownership are privately held. They're owned by, in many cases, just a, a very few number of people, uh, sometimes only one person, sometimes just a few. They own the court, the shares of the of the corporation because they started the business or they started the organization. So that's usually how it starts. Um, you can remain a privately held corporation all of the existence of the corporation. That that happens to a few. I don't know if you know about uh, Cargill because uh, they're in agricultural supplies, but you probably have heard of a company called Bose because they are they are extremely large. Um, very popular because they make all types of <clears throat> musical and other types of instruments that um, that you see, you know, headphones and other types of speakers, uh, their equipment in the very high end cars, etc. Bose. Uh, Bose is a private corporation, which means that even though it's a it's a multinational corporation, it's all over the world. 
the shares of ownership in the corporation are held privately by the late Dr. Bose, because Dr. Bose passed a couple of years ago. His, uh, his team, his associates, his family, et cetera, they're the only ones who own the shares of ownership in the company. So they're the only ones who know what's going on in Bose. They're the only ones who know the revenue. They're the only ones who know the profitability. They're the only ones that know about what assets they own. They, that's what privately held means. It's private business. It's a, it, all the information is private. It's different when, peop, when companies decide to, what they say, go public. A publicly held corporation is, as the word it, uh, implies, anyone in the public can own shares of stock in the company. And so once a company decides to go from a privately held company to a publicly held company, they have changed their ownership. So anyone in the public can purchase shares of stock to become a stockholder in the company. Um, most corporations go through this. All the corporations you see on, uh, that you hear about on the news and you watch the stock market news, et cetera, they all started as privately held corporations. Uh, eventually they decided that they wanted to go public. Why would they want to go public? Well, mostly because when you offer shares of ownership to the public, you can raise a ton of money. And you can raise just billions and billions of dollars uh, relatively easily. <clears throat> so the incentive to go public oftentimes is, uh, is just to raise a, a obscene amount of money. Um, but when you go public, uh, the rules change, okay? Then all the information is public. Uh, you have to deal with certain laws that are on the books from the SEC, Securities Exchange Commission is the uh, government branch that oversees all publicly traded corporations. So if you have stock you're, and, and I, you and I can buy a share of stock, it's a public corporation. Uh, so the SEC has certain laws and guidelines, and that's why we're learning about GAAP, generally accepted accounting principles in this course. It's because public corporations need standards in which to report to the public how it's doing in terms of income statements and balance sheets, et cetera. So really GAAP is meant for the publicly held corporation so it can meet the standards of accuracy, clarity, strong representation, et cetera, and follow the laws. And that's why it's important. That's why we've been talking all about GAP in this course is because this course is based on a corporate form and not just a corporate form, but a publicly traded corporation. Okay. Uh, once that happens, you know, everything changes. So Facebook was private, it went public. <clears throat> When it goes public, that's when you hear about, you know, uh, people like Zuckerberg or Bezos of Amazon or years ago, Bill Gates of Microsoft, how they became like, oh, they're multi-billionaires and this guy is worth 120 billion, this guy's worth 50 billion. But how do we know that? Well, it's all publicly, it's, you know, if you're a publicly held co company, all the information is public. It's, it has to be, it has to be reported. So we know how many shares of Facebook stock Mark Zuckerberg owns, and we know the price of the stock, just simply looking at the stock exchange, you can see the price, and you do simple math, multiply it, boom, there's, there's how much that person is worth on the books at least, right? That's how we know so many things about so many public figures is because all the information is public, it's disclosed. It has to be disclosed because they're public corporations because anybody in the public can read it and decide, hey, I wanna be an owner in Facebook and buy shares. That's the reason all that stuff has to be uh, disclosed. We live in an area where IBM is big. IBM is a publicly traded corporation. And so, you know, you can go down the line, McDonald's, <clears throat> you know, um, you have Walmart. I mean, these are, they're all publicly traded corporations. So all the information is public. So in terms of characteristics, I'm gonna go through this pretty quick because we've seen this from chapter one. Um, advantages and disadvantages of the corporate form. Because again, you can, be a, you can be a sole proprietorship, you can be a partnership, or you can be a corporation. 
and um, there are certain advantages um, that are involved. So one is this idea of a separate legal existence. When you're a corp, when you're a sole proprietor, when you're a, a partner, you are the business. There's no distinguishing between you, the person, and you, the business person. So that means everything that you do and everything that you own, <laughs> literally, is up for grabs in the worst case scenario. If you get, if you do something really stupid and get sued, you could lose everything, both all your business assets and your personal assets are up for grabs. When you establish a corporation, the corporation is its own separate legal entity, separate from the people who started it, okay? Um, and that's really important to sort of understand. And in the same vein, that's what limited liability means. When you say about limited liability, you're talking about the owners of a corporation who we call stockholders, they're limited to whatever money they invested in the company. So if I put $10,000 in a corporation, um, that's the most I can lose, that's the limit. If I'm a sole proprietor and I put $10,000 into my business, then I can actually lose more than 10,000 because there's no difference between me, the person and me, the business. So if something goes wrong, not only are they gonna, they're gonna come after me and I am both a person and the business. So everything is at risk, unlimited liability. But a corporation, it's limited to your investment. Um, the idea of transferable ownership rights really is a big one too, because all you're seeing every day on the stock market is shares of ownership being traded. Some people already have those shares, they wanna sell them. Other people wanna look, wanna buy them. That's the only thing that happens on the stock market, by the way. I mean, if you look at it on the base level, it's quite boring because all that's happening is shares of ownership are being exchanged. That's it for money. Um, but as you see already, it's, well, I mean, it's, the market's gonna open in 15 minutes. Um, you probably have, you know, millions and millions of shares of McDonald's stock traded. Nothing has changed at your local McDonald's, even though there's millions of new owners, nothing has changed. Millions of owners ship of, has changed for, for Walmart. Nothing has changed at Walmart. Um, so this idea of transferable ownership rights is stockholders can, you can sell your stock at any time. Uh, and it doesn't affect the business at all. If I was a sole proprietor and I sold my business, everything changed, everything. Um, that doesn't happen with a corporation, which is great. Like I said earlier, uh, the reason to go public and, or to be a corporation is you can, you can simply issue shares of stock um, and, and raise a good amount of money. Um, <clears throat> corporations are the best bet for raising lots of money. Um, the business can continue long after the people who started it passed. Uh, so this idea is a, what we call the going concern. Um, it's also about continuous life. You know, Henry Ford's pushing up daisies, but Ford Motor Company is still uh, alive and well. Walt Disney is either dead or frozen or whatnot. Uh, you know, whatever you want to believe. But Disney is still much bigger than he'd ever thought it would be. Um, you know, Steve Jobs started Apple, he's, uh, he's passed, but Apple still ex is in existence. Why? Because corporations have a continuous life. It's not dependent on any of, um, of the starters, the founders of the company. Whereas if I had a company, I was a sole proprietorship and I died, that's it, business is over. That's not true for a corporation, continuous life. Some things that can be, um, uh, this is both a plus and a minus, uh, the separation of ownership. So, you know, ownership of a corporation is for our stockholders, but stockholders are not active managers. They are passive, right? They, they have a board of directors who helps manage the company for them. Um, so as owners, even if, if I have shares of ownership at McDonald's, I go to McDonald's, they get my hamburger wrong. I say, hey, I'm an owner, you're fired. No, I can't do that because that's not the role of ownership in a corporation. Um, the ownership uh, is separate from the management of the company, which is why, like I was saying, with the transferable ownership rights, stockholders can sell their shares of ownership at any time, the company goes on. Why? Well, because it's separate. 
management and ownership is separated in the corporate form, which is a plus. Um, it can also be a minus in the sense that if you hire people, Ben and Jerry's had this, uh, had this problem, when they, when they were expanding, they hired new corporate management um, that had very different values than Ben and Jerry. You need, they needed to hire hippies who were managers and they just hired basically, you know, Columbia MBAs and it, you know, it, it didn't work out as well for them. So it can be a disadvantage when you can actually hire specialists. Uh, they may not share the same vision. Um, something that's called a, considered a disadvantage, uh, I can disagree with a little bit. Government regulation, yes, most government laws, whether it's state laws or federal laws, hit corporations more than any other form of business. Um, and that costs corporations money. Why it's considered a disadvantage is it's a cost for them. Mm, okay, so here's what I mean by how sometimes I just don't care. One is the cost of customer service, for example. I mean, federal government set up customer uh, consumer rights. Prior to the 60s, if you bought something from a corporation and it didn't work, there's no customer service. They're like, oh, well, better luck next time. Um, well, when consumers got rights, corporations had to set up customer service departments to take care of customers who had complaints. And that, yeah, that did cost money for the corporation. Yes, it did. But, you know, they shouldn't be screwing their customers anyway. So, you know, yes, it was a cost. It's a disadvantage that way. Government forced that to happen, but it should have been happening anyway. Same thing with human resources. I mean, when my father got hired in 1958, he just showed up, say, I'm looking for a job. And the guy said, hey, you can start Monday. No application process. I mean, if my father was black or Hispanic, uh, or whatever, and he showed up and the, the guy could have said, oh, we don't have any jobs today. Um, so with civil rights and other types of laws, yes, human resources was born out of that. It became more um, of a complex part of, the, of a corporation, but you know, they shouldn't be discriminating in the first place. So you know, in essence, yes, these laws do hit corporations hard customer service was spawned out of that, uh, human resources was spawned out of that. That's a lot of departments in a corporation that are results of laws that were passed. But to me, you know, I think it's a wash. They shouldn't have been doing that in the first place. So um, yes, it's a disadvantage because of costs, but you know, I get it. I don't care. Uh, additional taxes in this sense, is interesting because when a corporation declare, you know, has uh, net income, right? They have to pay taxes on that net income. But what can they do with their net income? Well, they can share it with the with the owners as a dividend. So the owners get dividends, and guess what? Then the owners have to pay taxes on those dividends. So this is what we call additional taxes. Sometimes it's called double taxation. Um, in terms of how a corporation is set up, uh, the owners are definitely on the top here, but they don't have a lot of control. They basically vote for uh, a board of directors to help run the company. The board of directors is meant to set goals that help enrich the owners. The board of directors also is the ones that hire the upper management team, the executives, to get that stuff done. Okay. So, um, so this is basically the, the basic structure of the corporation. Okay. Uh, yes, there are other types of forms of business that you've heard about, like LLCs, LLPs. Um, let me just tell you that they are, they're hybrids. They are part corporation and part partnership and the best of both worlds. So they're simply hybrids of those other forms. So you'll, if you take in business law two, you'll, um, you'll get into this in, in sig significant detail. Um, but I'm just gonna show you that there are other forms that are basically hybrids. So like I said, to form a corporation, you need to, you need to apply. You apply with the state government. Every state has a governor, lieutenant governor, treasurer. They also have a secretary of state. Um, and so the Secretary of State's office runs the uh, lots of different things, but they they run um, 
the, uh, the corporations division for states process the applications, uh, make sure everything is legally correct. And once the Secretary of State approves the application, that application becomes what's called a corporate charter. And that is what basically makes the corporation an, uh, a legal entity under the law. Okay, at that point, it's recognized as a legal entity under the law. So that's really important. All states have different uh, forms, different rules. Some states have very favorable corporate rules. So states like Delaware are favorite places to incorporate. Uh, even if your company is in Maine or out in you know, Wisconsin or, or Kansas, um, Delaware is a favorite state to incorporate in because their, their laws are favor, favorable to the corporate form and easy to do. Corporations um, need to get a license from the state in which they're doing business. So they are basically registered as a business in that state. Okay. So if you're an owner, you're a stockholder, what rights do you have? Probably the most important right they like to say is you have a right to vote in the election of the board of directors. So, um, so that is uh, only true for common stock. Common stock is one share, one vote. So it's quite egalitarian, but, so, but, if, but if you have 10 shares, you get 10 votes. I have one share, I get one vote. So it's still one share, one vote, but if you have more vote, more shares, you got more votes. Um, you have a right, this is not a guarantee, it's a right to a dividend, share earnings. For a corporation to give a dividend, they need to be profitable, sharing of the profits. Uh, that's important. Oops, another right that corporation uh, stockholders have in a corporation is something called a preemptive right, which means that they have a right to keep their ownership state the same when the company issues new shares. So for example, if I own, um, you know, a hundred and uh, if I own 14 shares out of a hundred, I own 14% of the company. If the company wants to issue a hundred new shares, I have a right to keep my 14%, which means I get the first right to buy the new shares. So I can keep my 14% ownership in the company. That's it, that's all that means. <clears throat> this is a right you don't want to have exercised because in this case, the company is out of business. It's liquidated. Um, in the case of liquidation, the lenders or the creditors get paid first. Liquidation means a, a court orders all of the assets to be sold. When they, when that happens, uh, courts will say lenders or creditors go first. So you get first dibs. Whatever is sold from these assets of the company, you pay the debts first. If there's anything left over after all the debts are paid, the stockholders get what's left. That's called a residual claim. I will tell you, it never happens. This is what a stock, uh, a share of stock looks like if it's printed out. Um, again, it, it, it's, it is a security, so it's, it's a legal issue. You'll have your name and information in the middle, how many shares of stock you own in the company, et cetera. Okay. So, Let's go back to this idea of when you uh, apply for to become a corporation and the state approves it. As part of the application, you have to tell the state how many shares of ownership you want to be recognized for your corporation. In the state of New York, the minimum is 200, okay? But you can have 200,000, you can have 200 million, doesn't really matter. You'll pay for those extra shares, but you can have as many shares of ownership as you want. Once the application is approved, right, and it becomes a legally recognized entity, the shares that are part of the application become what we call authorized stock, okay? Which means that if I'm just a basic, I get the 200 shares as part of my application, and my application becomes approved as Mike Incorporated. Mike Incorporated has 200 shares of legally recognized authorized stock, okay? So it's the legal re legally recognized shares of stock with that 
um, with that application. Okay. Authorized stock doesn't mean that it's been sold to investors. It's just what the what the state has legally recognized for you to have. But it's the starting point. From your authorized stock, you sell your, you sell some of those shares. When you sell shares of stock, that's what an issue is. To issue shares is to sell shares. So if you have 200 shares of ownership, recognized authorized stock, you don't have to sell all 200 shares. You can sell 50, you can sell 100, you can sell 10. Um, however many shares you need to sell to raise money you need. In the meantime, you'll still have that authorized stock to, to sell at a later date when you need to raise more money. Sometimes that's not enough, so you have to apply for more shares. And that is another part of the application process that just breaks your company into more shares that are legally recognized as authorized stock. So authorized stock, <clears throat> uh, you take a portion of that and you sell it. That's issued stock. Okay, issued stock is the shares of authorized stock that you've sold to raise money. So corporations can sell shares in a couple of ways. Um, they can share, uh, they can sell directly to investors, which is what private corporations do all the time. Um, or they can go through an investment banking firm and uh, for a publicly traded company and raise money through um, through the markets, which is what the investment banking is really sort of the fundraising of capitalism. They're the fundraisers of capitalism. They help find money, raise money for corporations and governments. So that's what investment bankers do. If you're going through an investment bank, you're gonna be a public company. And so you'll be traded on a public exchange. So that means your shares of ownership are available to be traded on any of the exchanges. Uh, clearly, the big kahuna here is is the New York Stock Exchange. It's the largest. It has a. It's the oldest as well. Um, it's not as old as London, but it's about as big. Uh, the Nasdaq is electronic exchange between brokers. There's no trading floor. It's just a network of computers. Okay. Whereas the New York Stock Exchange has the same network of computers, but they have literally a trading floor. You can see it when you put on the news and watch the business news, you'll see people walking around a floor. That's it's literally a trading floor. Um, so there's, there are all over the world. London's a big market. Tokyo is a big market in Asia. Um, Euronext is actually uh, New York Stock Exchange and Euronext merged together to form a large exchange. Euronext is some of the biggest markets in Europe, like um, uh, on the continent, so like in Germany or France, things like this. So um, those exchanges. Okay, so when a company decides to sell or issue shares of stock, they need to do a little bit of accounting on that. They have to keep track of that. Most stock is accounted for with something called a par value. And a par value is simply an assigned value. It's, it's really kind of made up. Uh, it could be a penny, it could be a buck per share, whatever. It's just something in which we need to do to put down as in accounting as a value of our common stock at the core. And so you'll often see par value listed for a common stock when you read a balance sheet. There are, however, many states that do not require a par value. So they'll simply just be uh, companies that have what we call no par common stock. So common stock is listed at whatever they've raised for money. Um, so that's just something to, to know. Uh, when corporations um, ask shareholders to buy shares of stock, um, this is what we call paid in capital. Paid in capital, all, all companies have common shares. So all companies have common stock. Um, common stock is common ownership. It maintains all the rights that you heard about a little bit earlier. 
However, some companies, in addition to having common stock, will raise money and, and issue something called preferred stock. Now, preferred stock is still stock. It still shares of ownership in the company. However, these shares of stock do not have voting rights. They forfeited a very important right that common stockholders have, which is voting rights. Why would they do that? Why would you give up um, that right? Well, because preferred stockholders are promised a dividend first before common stockholders get a dividend. So in essence, they're giving up the right to vote for you know, first dibs at the dividends. Okay. Now, like was said earlier, this, um, whether they have common stock or preferred stock, it's listed on the balance sheet at some type of par value or stated value. Okay. For common stock, a common par value is something like a buck. For preferred stock, a common par value is actually like a hundred bucks. Okay. A par value is simply a core value. Doesn't mean that every time they go and sell a share of common stock, it's for a buck. Okay. Um, it just means that's the core value for accounting. That's how they keep the record. What if they sell those common shares at 10 bucks? Well, the first dollar is put into the common stock account. All the other dollars are put into something called paid in capital in excess of par. But these will add together. So if it's a $10, if you sell your stock for $10, the first dollar will be credited to the common stock account. The other $9 will go into the paid in capital account. And that's it. That's really all there is to it. This is called paid in capital because literally owners need to pay the money in. That's money coming in from the owners. They put cash in in exchange for shares. So that is paid in capital. Okay. But that's not the only source of capital the company has. Okay. The company has retained earnings, which as you know, Retained earnings is the earnings, the profits of the company that have been retained. They are also owned by the owners, by the stockholders, which is why it's a stockholders equity account. So again, any type of stock is a paid in capital account because the owners literally have to pay in the money to get the shares. Retained earnings is the profit of the company that has been retained. In other words, not paid out as a dividend. Those are the two different ways we look at equity, paid in capital and retained earnings. So again, another term to know. Okay. So, you know, a little bit of true fault stuff for, for that, but, but here we go. So a little bit more on preferred, common stock and preferred stock is in learning objective two in general. Uh, I'm not going to emphasize too much the accounting as much as I am the terminology, which is really important here. Okay. So first of all, an example of um, an example of this idea of par value. So here we have a company, Hydroslide. They issue 2,000 shares, so that they sold 2,000 shares of common stock. This is a dollar par value common stock. If they sold it for a thousand dollars, I'm sorry. If they sold a thousand shares at a buck um, per share, what would it look like? Well, they would raise a thousand dollars in cash and common stock, which is a dollar par, and they sold it for a dollar. All of the money they raised would be part of common stock. But what if they sold those thousand shares for five dollars? Well, then they would raise five thousand dollars in cash. The first dollar of that would be credited to the common stock account. So $1,000 would go into common stock. The other $4, because they sold it for five, all the remaining amount goes into the paid in capital for excess. So they raise $5,000 of cash, but on the record, they have to break it into the par value of common stock and paid in capital in excess of par for common stock. So that's what they mean by that. That's just an example. So you have to read that and sort of understand. So as you see on a balance sheet, 
you will see stockholders equity as paid in capital and retained earnings, the two um, ways in which we look at stockholders equity. For paid in capital, of course, whatever stock is they have, they, every company has common stock. Some companies also have preferred stock. So here they would have the common stock account plus their paid in capital in excess of par. But it would still be, again, all of this is still common stock. Just they break it up for accounting purposes. That's it. Okay. Um, preferred stock works the same way. Again, I'm not really going to be uh, getting very detailed into the preferred stock issue, but it works the same way. Okay. So that's all for learning objective two, just so you know a little bit about what that is. One thing that's very, very important part of this objective too is something called treasury stock. Okay. Treasury stock is when the corporation itself buys its own shares on the market. Uh, that's what the treasury stock is. Okay, so again, treasury stock is when the corporation buys its own stock. A corporation can only buy stock that's been issued. So in other words, the stock was already sold to investors and is out there. That's the only shares of stock that's available to get sold, to get bought back. Um, so you can't just, they just can't take authorized stock and take it for themselves. That's not how it works. Authorized stock needs to be issued and sold to investors. And then if the corporation wants to buy that back, they buy it from the investors. That's treasury stock. Why would a corporation buy its own stock? I would say the most important reason you should know is that a lot of corporations promise their managers stock options and bonus uh, programs that are based on stock. In order for the corporation to pay the manager stock, they have to own it. So in essence, they, they buy the stock, so they have it there. And when the managers hit their goals, they issue it to the officers, to the, to the corporate officers as payment as part of their compensation, okay? Um, there's other reasons why they can buy back their own shares that are listed here, but I will tell you that's probably the most practical reason corporations buy their own stuff. So when a company buys its own stock, it buys it back at whatever it paid for it. Now, the interesting thing is treasury stock is a contra equity account. It's your first contra equity account that you've been introduced to, which means that common stock and preferred stock have credit balances. Treasury stock has a debit balance. Well, because when a corporation buys its own stock, it forfeits all of the rights. It's almost like dead stock. There's no voting rights. They don't get a dividend. They don't get nothing. Okay. Uh, because the corporation cannot do that to itself. That's part of the law, part of the rules, how it works. So in essence, treasury stock is, is dead stock, and thus it actually gets deducted from stockholders' equity, as you'll see. So first, let's do an example of how that works with this company called Mead. Mead has uh, common stock, as you see here, and this is something you need to know how to read, is a balance sheet. So here we have read companies paid in capital. They have common stock, $5 par value. So that's the accounting value of the stock. That's it. Right. Anything above five bucks that they raise is paid in capital in excess. 400,000 shares authorized. Now remember, we said authorized are the legally recognized shares of ownership with their application. Just because it's authorized doesn't mean they can they automatically sell it all or it's automatically issued. It's simply what's legally recognized in their application. From their authorized stock, they decide how many to issue or to sell to raise money. This company rate sold 100,000 shares. Issued means to sell. So of the 400,000 shares they have authorized, they sold 100,000 of those shares to raise money. All of those shares are still owned by the public. When shares are owned by the public, we call that outstanding shares, okay? So 
that's how you would read. So these are important terms, authorized, issued, outstanding, treasury stock, all super important terms you need to know. Okay. But look what happens. In February, they acquire 4,000 of its own stock. So Me Corporation went out and bought 4,000 of its own shares, eight bucks a share. So they're gonna record that at cost. Treasury stock gets debited because treasury stock is a contra equity account. So it's gonna be reduced, it's gonna be deducted from stockholders equity as you'll see in a moment, okay. So how does the balance sheet look now? Well, the balance sheet's gonna change a little bit, okay. They are still gonna list their paid in capital as common stock, $5 par, 400,000 shares have been authorized, we know that. Here's what's changed. They did issue or sell 100,000 shares to investors, that's true. However, only 96,000 of these shares are still owned by investors. Why? Because 4,000 of these shares are now owned by the corporation as treasury stock. So yes, they did sell 100,000 shares to raise money, but the corporation bought back 4,000 of those shares. Thus only 96,000 shares are still uh, outstanding, still owned by the public. That's what you have to know too. The difference between authorized, issued, outstanding and treasury, very important concepts to know. Okay, so that uh, that's that. Learning objective three is really about dividends, but we're only gonna focus on the most popular type of dividend, which is a cash dividend. Remember a dividend, a cash dividend is when the corporation has a profit and they share a portion of the profit with the stockholders. That's basically it, in the form of cash. Usually dividends are expressed as a dollar amount per share. So oftentimes they'll declare a dividend of say, you know, 10 cents per share. So that means every share of ownership is gonna get a 10 cent dividend. You have one share, you get 10 cents. You get 10, you have 10 shares, you get a buck, right? Um, so depending on how many shares, you just multiply it by the dividend per share. Um, that's normally how dividends are expressed when a corporation uh, declares it. Sometimes it can be expressed as a percentage of the par. And that's the, this is true overwhelmingly for, for preferred stock. However, for common stock, it's almost always listed as a dollar amount per share. So again, in order for a company to, de to have uh, to go to cash dividends, the only the only entity in the corporate form who has the power to declare a dividend is the board of directors. The board of directors has the sole and exclusive right to declare cash dividends. Dividends will be paid just to shareholders. But there are certain rules that have to be in place, usually by state law, okay? First is the company has to have retained earnings. They have to have profits. Um, and second, they have to have enough cash to pay the cash dividend. They just can't say we're going to give you 10 cents a share and then not have any money, uh, not have any cash. So they have to be uh, legally required to have both in many cases, but certainly they have to have profits in order to have a dividend. Okay. And again, what's important to know is that board of directors is the only uh, entity in the corporate structure who can declare a dividend. Three very important dates to know about dividends. Uh, here you have a calendar with December and January. On December 1st, the board of uh, directors has said, we are going to pay a dividend uh, of 50 cents a share. That is called the declaration date. Now what happens on the declaration date is the company has an, announced formally they're gonna pay a dividend to their owners. So that means they owe money now. They've actually created a liability. <laughs> they promised their owners a dividend. So that's actually gonna be a liability account called dividends payable when they do that. So they declare it on a particular day. Now the question becomes who gets the dividend, right? It's not just who let the dogs out, but who gets the dividend. 
So uh, that's what this second date is for. Notice the second date here is something called a record date. Now, <clears throat> just to know, even though there are millions and millions of shares of stock traded every day, actually in the billions in total, but say in a corporation like McDonald's, there are millions of shares of stock traded every day on the market. All of the, so that means some people own more shares, some people own less shares, blah, blah, blah. Some are new shareholders, some are, are no longer shareholders. There are specialized companies that's, that do the record keeping on all of that, okay? Um, and so they are, uh, they're often called transfer agents, but their main business really is to keep track of all the record keeping for these corporations. And thus they are keeping records of who owns these shares, how many shares they own at the end of a day, blah, blah, blah. So what happens is the corporation says, look, on, at the end of the day, on, the, on this case, on the 22nd, at the end of the trading day, trading day ends at four o'clock, whoever owns the shares of stock, they're the ones that are gonna get the dividend. Those are the ones that we're gonna cut checks for. Okay. So the record date is simply a day in which the corporation gets handed a record, a list of all the owners, all their shares, et cetera. Uh, there's no accounting to be done because you're literally just getting a package. I'm not getting a package uh, of papers delivered by UPS. Nothing really, no accounting has happened. There was no financial transaction, you just got a whole bunch of papers now. So that's all a record date is because once you declare a dividend, you gotta, you gotta pay somebody. Who are you gonna pay? Whoever owns the stock at the end of the day on the record date. Then you, it's going to, as you notice, there's a little bit of time because you've got a few weeks here until you're actually paying that because you need all this time to set up, you know, you're going to cut checks or, or wire money. So you're going to set all that up. That takes time. So the corporation is setting all that stuff up. And then on the payment date is when they actually send out the check or wire the cash to the owners. Okay, uh, that's called a payment date. On the payment date, that's when the cash moves. Okay, so three very important dates, declaration, record date, payment date. Declaration date requires accounting. Record date does not. Payment date requires accounting to be done. How does it look in general? Say this company, Media General, declares a 50 cent dividend per share on 100,000 shares. So 100,000 shares of stock are gonna get a 50 cent dividend per share. So what happens? Well, on the declaration date, they have, they have debited cash dividends for 50,000 and they've set up the $50,000 payable, dividend payable. How do they get $50,000? 100,000 shares times 50 cents per share gives you the 50,000. So the declaration date, you, we're going to be doing some accounting. On the record date, we're just getting a list of the owners. There's no, no entry. You're just getting a whole list of people who and how many shares they own, so you know how to do your records. And then when you actually pay it, then your liability will be paid off that day, and you'll be sending out a whole bunch of cash. So that's basically all we need to know about the dividends. Okay, I'm not doing anything else with that. We're not doing, these are interesting topics, but we're not doing them here. Lastly, some analysis, okay. Stockholders equity, it's very important because it's part of the balance sheet. It needs to be reported uh, properly. And there's certain ways to analyze this from a stockholder's perspective, okay. So first of all, first off, you have how it looks on the balance sheet. Um, again, paid in capital is always going to be the first thing that you see. Again, all companies will have common stock. Some companies will have preferred stock as well. Okay, uh, but you just won't have a company that has preferred stock and no common. It'll all it'll be common and preferred, or just common. That's it. Um, and then they'll have retained earnings. So what if a company has no retained earnings? So Groupon has yet to make a profit. Right, according to this balance sheet. So what did they do? Well, they've recorded losses 
Well, where does that loss go? Well, that loss goes basically as what we consider kind of a negative retained earnings, but we don't call it that. We call it instead an accumulated deficit. And so accumulated deficit is this is how much this company has lost, okay, over the time it's existed, okay? And so I don't know, there's no date on it. So I don't know exactly, you know, how long this has been, but this is not unusual for new companies to, you know, not make a profit for a while. I think it took Amazon seven to nine years to make a profit. Uh, so they had a very large accumulated deficit at one point in time. Of course, now it's to totally turned around. Um, so there's no worries. But in this case, this is what happened. Who, who covers losses for a company? The stockholders do. You notice that it's the stockholders, the paid in capital, that's covering the loss that you see here. Okay. And interesting enough, this company has treasury stock. So very, very important to know. Um, just to know that some of these statements can be quite long. Here's a company that has both uh, preferred and common stock. So you that you paid in capital here, which is a very long list and your retained earnings on the bottom. Uh, here they have preferred stock and they have common stock. Preferred stock will get listed first in this case. Um, here the, they have a par value of that preferred. Like I said, it's usually about a hundred bucks. The 9% is the dividend that's owed every year. So 9% of a hundred is $9 in every hundred. Right? Every share gets $9 dividend every year. Um, they have 10,000 shares authorized, but they have only issued 6,000 and all of them are held by the public. So that's that common stock. Uh, they don't have a par, but they created this $5 stated value for the record. 500,000 shares authorized, 400,000 shares issued, 390 outstanding. Well, the difference between issued and outstanding is that 10,000, you're going to see that in treasury stock. Okay. That difference is always going to be what's going on in treasury stock. Uh, additional paid in capital is anything above the par value or the stated value that the company raised will be an additional paid in capital from either preferred or common stock. Um, and that's it, you'll see treasury stock here as well. So learning how to read those, really important, really, really important. This is gonna ask you to prepare a stock loss equity. I'm not gonna have you do that, but you need, you need to know how to read it, okay. So the analysis, there's two, maybe three tops on the analysis. One is very important um, for owners, which is something called the payout ratio. Uh, the payout ratio simply is how much of their, how much of their income are they paying out as dividends to the stockholders? So here you have, uh, it should be blank, literally, uh, dividends for each of these years. Uh, and nail, nail income, where is nail? Uh, net income here, uh, listed here for these years. So basically dividends over net income is really what payout ratio is. So it's how much of the net income did they pay out in the dividend? That's all this is. So cash dividends divided by net income for 2014, 30%, that's good, 2013, 29%, that's good. You don't want it to have, you want to see that as a reasonably low measure, you know, because you want it to be sustainable over time. You don't want a company paying out 90% of their earnings as dividends, dividend because what are they keeping in the company? How are they reinvesting? How are they growing? That's not really sustainable over time. So uh, a dividend payout ratio that's a little bit on the low side is really actually pretty good right? because there's plenty of room to grow. And it's quite sustainable, which means that as a stockholder, you're probably still going to get a dividend for a long period of time. Okay. Another thing that uh, stockholders want to know is how do they do? What was their return on their equity? So return on common stockholders' equity um, is a measure, a financial measure that they'll look at because they want a high return on their on their equity. How do you calculate it? Well, it's your net income. Basically, most of the time preferred 
dividends are zero, like they are here, because only seven or 8% of corporations today have preferred stock, which means 92% of them don't. So 92% of the time, this is going to be a fat old zero right here. So it's your net income over your average equity for common stock. So here you have uh, in 2014, their uh, income was 2.6 billion over about 11 billion in equity. That's a 24.6% return on equity. That's really great. Anything in double digits is great. In 2013, it was very similar, 23% um, equity, uh, return on equity. So these are really, really good. Really, really good. Right. Uh, how, many, how many dollars of profit has been earned for each dollar of equity is really what this tells the owners. So it's a very, very important uh, issue. Something that you, you're going to learn a lot more about when you get into a finance class um, is this idea of, you know, what should companies do? Should companies borrow money or should companies ask stockholders for, for more money? Uh, that's a debt versus equity decision. Uh, just know that they, they there's a lot of that decision takes a lot of thinking because if you go with debt, then you have more debt, but your stockholders are happy because they still have control of the company. Uh, whereas if you if you issued more shares of stock, now you have more stockholders, and like what happened? I don't own as much as the company as I used to. There are more people to share profits with. There are more decision makers. Uh, stockholder control is something that's important. Anytime you do have debt, you pay interest. You can write that interest off as an expense. Can't do that with stock, right? Um, and what is the return on common stockholders equity? That, that, that calculation we just looked at, that's important. Would it go up or down if we issued more, if we issued bonds or if we issued more stock? What would happen to my return as a stockholder? That's something they want to know. Okay, so um, that's important. You will have a couple of uh, quick exercises on analysis of stockholders' equity here. Um, again, the return on common stockholders' equity, uh, net income minus dividends on preferred stock divided by the average equity. So you got your beginning and ending. You average that out. Um, and so for this particular uh, example here for 2017, um, you got a $100,000 difference here and $400,000 of equity. So it's a 25% return. Uh, for 2016, you still have $100,000 of profits, uh, but over a half a million dollars of equity, it's a 20% return. So clearly fewer shares, um, uh, happened uh, to help. In this case, when they purchased treasury stock, it lowered the stockholders' equity, which actually helped own owners have a higher return. Okay. So lots of concepts, lots of concepts to understand here, um, but important ones to understand. Not very much accounting, just to sort of understand how it's done, how to read a balance sheet, stockholders' equity section, important. Uh, authorized, issued, outstanding, treasury stock, very important. Cash dividends, declaration date, record date, payment date, very important. And uh, a few tidbits on some analysis there. Okay, questions?